Uh, we're going to get right into worship. If you want to stand or sit and find a place to make yourself comfortable, do whatever you please. We're just going to worship our Lord today.
we are designed for relationships. We're made for a relationship with God, that's true, but also relationships with other people. Right? When Adam was in the garden, God wasn't like, I'm enough for you. He said, no, you need other people like you, just like God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit exist in relationship with each other. We as humans need relationships with other humans. Now we're halfway through a series on becoming people of love because I think we need to go back to school after you're like 2020 or 2021 and learn at the feet of Jesus how to become people of love. And we don't automatically become people of love just by saying like, well, I read my Bible, now I'm a person of love. Or I'm a Christian, now I'm a person of love. Just like you don't automatically lose weight by reading a diet book, right? You have to change some behaviors. Um, you don't automatically lose weight by watching an exercise video. You have to do some exercises. Becoming people of love is a cooperative action between you and Jesus. And that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks. Now, when I was growing up in church, every time in church I attended, did a series on relationships, and then one thing, it was all about marriage and parenting. They didn't care about any other relationship. And so I would dread, as a single 20-something attending church, I was like, oh good, it's a relationship study. I'm going to hear about the marriage I don't have and the kids I don't have, and be bored out of my mind even more than normal. Um, so I try to make this series something different. But at the same time, we can't avoid talking about marriage and dating and being single. Um, as a single 20-something, I oftentimes feel out of place in church, um, especially during times when we were talking about relationship series. So I'm going to try to be uniquely sensitive today to those watching online or those who are here. Um, the church I attended most of my life was designed to minister to families, and the unspoken ultimatum I felt was, the church is here for you once you get married and have kids. And I wanted Horizon to be something different, a church that can impact people no matter what relationship status you have. And so hopefully it is that and continues to be that. When in my late 20s, um, I felt like everyone I knew was married or in a long-term dating relationship or had been married and remarried. Um, and everywhere I looked in culture, it felt like people were saying, you don't really start living until you fall in love. Just watch a movie. Just watch any sitcom, right? There's always the two main characters, and you're like, Jim and Pam, are they ever going to fall in love? I mean, that's when things are really going to happen, and we're waiting for that moment. That's why we kept watching this show. Um, it was funny, yes, but we were really invested in those, those falling in love moments. And not only does culture say that, church says the exact same thing. Many times our churches are saying, you really don't start living until you're married. Um, it's not often that our church and our culture say the same things about something or have so close and similar philosophies, but on the subject of falling in love and marriage and dating romance, um, we have some differences, certainly, but we have a lot of similarities at the core of the foundation. Both the culture and the American church, I believe, have unhealthy views of marriage that we're going to dissect today. Um, many times, marriage has been held up as the highest calling of your life. This is the greatest, most important thing you're ever going to do, get married. And while marriage is solemn and important, it is not the highest expectation or the highest calling of your life. And making it the highest calling of your life turns marriage into an idol that can't bear the weight of your expectations. If you go into marriage saying, this is going to be the greatest thing that happens to me in my entire life, spend a couple years in that marriage and you'll be like, what have I done? Not that marriage is terrible, but that you'll realize if you make it the highest point of your existence, it just can't go up to that. We have to correct our incorrect thinking about marriage, and when we do so, it'll correct our incorrect views about dating and romance. And if we correct our incorrect views about dating and romance, it'll correct some of the incorrect views we have about being single. So, let's kick off today with a quote about marriage that I use constantly. I say it so much, my wife hates it. She hates to hear it, because I literally say it all the time. So I told her, I was like, hey, just so you know that quote you hang on, I'm gonna say it today in my sermon myself. Just break yourself, Darby. This is a quote from Timothy Kelly about the meaning of marriage. Marriage doesn't bring you into conflict with your spouse, it brings you into conflict with your own self. And so when I get angry at Darby, who is a lovely, wonderful wife, by the way, I'm very thankful to be married to her. 
When I get mad at her, I stop and have to remind myself of this quote. What I'm really mad about is I'm selfish and I'm not getting my way. I'm feeling anger towards her, but what I'm really mad about is I'm selfish and I'm not getting what I want. And all of a sudden, it reframes the whole argument or disagreement or uh, even conversation that we're having. Let's look at what, um, sorry. So why start here? Well, because Christianity, according to the Bible, means that marriage isn't primarily designed to meet your needs, but to correct your selfishness. It's a very different way of looking at marriage than you usually think about it. Marriage is an avenue to discipleship. The greatest act of human fulfillment is not marriage, but apprenticeship to Jesus. Living and loving like Jesus is the greatest human uh, experience that you can have. It's the most fulfilling experience. And if you try to make marriage that, it will disappoint you. Marriage happens to be one way we can be continuously reminded of how much we still have to grow. When I was single, I thought I was a pretty good person. I really did. I attended church all the time. I was going to seminary. I was involved in a million committees, a million ministries. Every day of the week, I was at a church or a church event. I mean, I was just doing everything. And I was like, I'm pretty good. I'm not doing any of these sins. You know, I don't have any of these vices. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm a pretty amazing Christian. Like, that's what 20 something year old Alex thought. Look how good I am. Then I got married and I realized I am very selfish. I like things my way, and if I don't get them my way, I get very angry. And all of a sudden I realize, oh, I have a lot more growth that needs to happen on the inside. I've fixed a lot of things on the outside so that people who don't know me very well think, oh, he's got it together. But people who get close, well, they help me see that I still have a long way to go. And that's one of the benefits of marriage. Let's look at what Paul says about becoming a person of love in marriage in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verses 22 to 23, or 33, says this. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as you do to the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water and the word, and present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed it and cared for their body, just as Christ does the church. We are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two will become one in flesh. Now, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about the mystery of Christ and the church. That's what Paul is really mystified by. He says, we've all become one in Jesus. In verse 33, however, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Um, before this, I lived down in Tennessee. I was a pastor down there. I heard a man in the church I was at in Tennessee complaining one time about how his wife didn't submit to him. He's like, Ephesians 5 says she should submit to me in everything, he shouted. Um, and I asked him quite simply, have you died for her? He was like, no. I was like, well then, it says you're supposed to die for her. Like, if you're supposed to die for her like Jesus did, if you haven't died, then why are you getting mad that she hasn't submitted, right? It commands out of you. If we're going to take this so literally that she needs to submit to you, we need to take it literally enough that you need to die for her. Um, he didn't like that. He wanted her to do her part, but he didn't want to do his part. Perhaps if he had died for her, if he jumped in front of a bullet for her, she would respect him a lot more than if he got in her face and demanded that she submit to him all the time. Um, these verses have been painted as quite controversial over the years. However, I think if you read them in light of verse 21, last week we talked a long time about verse 21, which says to submit to each other, they become much less offensive. If you didn't hear last week's message, go back and listen to the podcast. It's worth the listen. I try to correct a lot of misunderstandings. Um, so what's the big takeaway here? Marriage calls the woman to submit and the man to die. That's two ways of saying the same thing. Marriage, a good marriage, is a union of two people allowing their selfishness to die. Their obsession with getting their way to die. 
Now those are not exactly the feel good verses that we read at a wedding, right? I've done a few weddings and no one's ever asked me like, could you read that part about where the man has to die for the wife in Ephesians 5 during the, the vows? No, no one ever said that. They want 1 Corinthians 13 with the love is all flowery and nice and good, but marriage is not designed to make you feel good. That's not its base foundational reason for existing. Marriage exists to make you good. And that's a key difference. Because there's sometimes in marriage where you're like, I'm not really enjoying this right now. That's not Darby's fault. Many times that's something going on inside of me. And I have to remember, I don't have to enjoy every moment. I have to look at whether this is bringing me into conflict with my own selfishness, so it forces me to change what's bro broken inside of me. Now, people need marriages every day because their needs aren't being met, but according to the Bible, the focus isn't on your needs being met, but on the needs of your spouse. Marriage teaches you to stop thinking of yourself all the time and to see someone else, to listen to someone else, to take care of the needs of someone else. Paul says that marriage makes you and your spouse one person. Just like the Father, Son, and Spirit are one God, we, the husband and wife, are now one. And the, the act of caring for the one who's a part of you, yet distinct and other from you, teaches you to see past what you want and see what someone else wants and needs. Now, Paul piggybacks off of this thought and uses it to also talk about the church, the community of disciples wanting to live and love like Jesus. And he says, you're all one in Jesus. And he's like, just like marriage is supposed to be teaching you to see the needs of others, the church is supposed to be teaching you to see the needs of other people. It's not just about you and what you want and just what you're going through. Other people are going through things. Other people need help. Other people are struggling and hurting and feeling lonely. The church, like marriage, should be teaching us to see past our needs and see what the people all around us need. That's how kingdom people see relationships, not as a means to find self-fulfillment, but as a means to fulfill others. Way too often, our culture and our church doesn't think much differently than this a lot of times. We see relationships as a means to fulfill ourselves, and that's just not how the biblical, uh, the biblical disciples of Jesus should be looking at relationships. How can we serve others? How can we give to others? Now, researchers at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, they did some tests and have shown how selflessly acting for the good of others reduces stress and anxiety and actually creates new neural pathways in your brain to make you feel more content and happy. So they studied people and they put them, had them do MRIs after, uh, so they could study their brains after they did selfish things and selfless things. And they found that by denying yourself, you actually obtain what you always wanted, happiness, fulfillment, and contentment. Yet, if you seek your own fulfillment, you'll come up empty, and if you're always seeking the fulfillment of others, somehow you'll feel fulfilled too. Science has just realized what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, makes sense. Uh, in Matthew 10, 39, Jesus said, if you lose your life, you'll find it. If you give it away, you'll find it. And so many times, I'm trying to take what would easily be given to me if I gave instead. So in light of all that, how should our romances and our dating be affected by all this? What kind of person should you be looking for? You're looking for someone who increasingly sets aside their selfishness for your needs. And yet, also challenges you to set aside your own selfishness with patience and kindness. So that's the type of person we should be looking for. You'd be like, wait a second. This is what my nephew asks all the time. He's 13 years old. He's been sitting with us. He literally asks all the time. I'm like, oh, we're going to go over there and see this person. And he goes, is she hot? That's the only thing a 13 year old wants to know. Is she hot? I'm like, oh, well, she's actually a lovely neighbor. She's a great person. Is she hot? I'm like, she's 75 years old. <laughs> that's all he cares about. Sometimes when we approach our dating relationships like that, that's all we care about. Andy Stanley says, you have the potential to be sexually compatible with many people, but your potential to be emotionally compatible with someone is a much smaller pool of people. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are going to look up. There's a very few people that are actually going to make you less selfish and are actually going to act less selfishly towards you. 
Long-term, lasting relationships aren't based on how attractive someone is or how passionate they make you. Long-term relationships are based on how well they can set aside their selfishness and how well they can inspire you to set aside your selfishness as well. Often we're attracted to someone because of how they look or our common interests, but dating is about finding out what kind of emotional intelligence someone has and how that relationship is going to develop you and how you are going to develop them. Um, I've seen this all the time. People bounce from bad relationship to bad relationship to avoid feeling alone. Um, in Tennessee, there was one person I knew who had five or six divorces and uh, instant remarriages, instant remarriages. And he was asking me to perform his next wedding ceremony. And I was like, I don't know if you've taken time to stop and think about why. Like, why do you keep going one year at a time to go to a new relationship? Um, and he, he found somebody else to marry him, so he just went on and ignored what I said. Um, but often, people that bounce from bad relationship to a bad relationship, to avoid feeling alone, bemoan the fact that they can't find any good men. You, you know that friend who's just like, I just can't find a good person. Or they're like, I can't find a good woman. They start out good and then they go crazy, you know? Um, if you're looking for someone to fulfill your loneliness, that means you're entering into a relationship with selfish goals. You're entering into a relationship not to serve someone, but you're entering into a relationship to be served. You're not entering into a relationship to have your selfishness erased, but to have it soothed. And selfishness that is soothed eventually turns into selfishness that is fed, and selfishness that is fed soon will eat your relationship alive. And some people bounce from relationship to relationship because they stay in it as long as their selfishness is being fed. When their selfishness gets too big for the relationship, they move on to a new one. People of love don't go looking for someone to be their friend. They look for someone to befriend. They're not looking for someone to fulfill them. They look at how they can fulfill someone else. And in the midst of giving of themselves sacrificially, they find themselves more full than they ever imagined. People of love aren't waiting around for someone to come and meet their needs. They're trying to meet the needs of others. So you say, okay, Alex, so does that mean that people of love just keep sacrificially, selflessly giving and giving and giving to a stubborn, selfish person who just keeps taking and giving nothing to the relationship? No. That is not you being a person of love. That's what we did go right? <laughs> um, love means, what does it mean to love? It means to want the best for someone else. If I love someone, I want them to become the best version of themselves. And because of that, people of love aren't afraid of conflict because they believe love is worth fighting for. Sometimes it isn't love that makes us avoid a hard conversation with a spouse or a romantic partner. It's apathy. We just don't want to deal with it. We don't think it's worth dealing with some unpleasantness in order to make this relationship better. That's not love. People we really care about are worth having heavy words with. Okay, finally, let's talk about being single. Now, when I attended Bible college, this was an orientation, okay? Freshman year, I'm like this fresh, like, freshman coming in, and I'm like, oh, look at this campus, you know? And uh, we sat down for orientation, and the dean of students got up and he goes, I don't care what degree you thought you were here to get, the only degrees that matter are MR and MRS degrees. This is the best place to find a good Christian spouse, and if you don't get married in the next four years while you're here, you'll probably never get married. Because you'll never have another great set of candidates as you have right here. And so he's like, get dating, get married. And that was our orientation. And I was like, I read the 150 page handbook, they're like, that doesn't matter, find a date. And, um, yeah, um, yeah, it was, it was a crazy place. It's amazing I turned out half as normal as I did. Um, when I attended churches, I would often hear them say things like this. Now, there may be some people out there. I haven't met them, maybe, but there probably is a few out there who God doesn't want to get married. But the will of God for most people, like 99.9% .9 is to get married. And so, you need to get married. Like, you know, like, here they are pushing me. I'm 24 years old, you know. I'm like, I barely know how to do my own laundry, let alone um, get married. As I'm near 30, um, with very few people willing to date me, 
very, I have a hilariously terrible game with her. Um, very few people, yeah, I'll tell you that. That's right. Um, as I neared 30, few people dated me, let alone wanted to marry me. Um, people would say very unhelpful things like this. I just know that someone great for you. Um, and that turned out to be true. But for some people, that doesn't turn out. And those kind of sayings aren't helpful. The reality is we live in the kingdom of death. We're citizens of the kingdom of life, which is rushing into our world. Yet we haven't escaped this dark kingdom. In this world, sometimes we long to be parents like Darby and I do. And we try and try to have a kid and we have a miscarriage. And we try and try to have a kid and we go to uh, fertility treatment and it fails and we spend thousands of dollars. And then we try and try to adopt. And for years after years, we're like, we just don't have any kids for you. But sometimes you long for something and it doesn't happen. Sometimes you long to be married and it doesn't happen. God never promises to give you everything you want. He promises that if you spend a lifetime with them, you will find being able to fulfill the deepest longings of your heart. And he promises that you will have fulfilling relationships with other humans. It may just not be the fulfilling human relationship that you think you need. He promises that he will be enough. Even if you and I don't get everything we want. You want to know how to how to know if you're a person of love? It's a real simple test, but it's a terrible test. Here's the real simple test. Look at how you act when you don't get what you want. Because people of love are always thinking about what others need and want, not what they need and want. If you're angry and you're frustrated, you're depressed, you're sullen. Because you don't get what you want, it's revealing that you have a deeper problem. You're not a person. God wants to help you become the kind of person who doesn't have to get everything they want in order to be happy or content. That's better than just giving you everything you want. What's better, giving a kid every demand of what they want, or rather teaching them that they don't need everything? The American church has long held marriage and parenting up as the highest calling for people, especially for women. Um, there's an unspoken hierarchy. I saw this a lot in the church in Tennessee. Um, this is such a weird thing. But a 19-year-old married woman feels like she has more authority and wisdom than a 35-year-old single woman does. Even though the 19-year-old may live a life totally opposite of Jesus, she's like, I'm married. And so I have this holy, you know, position. Because I've experienced marriage now, and you haven't, so I know it all. It's like, girl, you've been married two weeks. <laughs> and I wish that was a made up story. Um, finding someone to marry you doesn't mean you're more valuable or that you're suddenly more wise than someone who didn't. Some of the greatest Christian writers and thinkers of all time have been people who did not marry. American churches since the late 70s and 80s have programmed themselves, they've designed the whole church to be around attracting casual Christians with numerous activities and moralistic lessons for children. I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but it's just the way that churches have done it. Um, the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S. recently released data confessing that the, the majority of their spiritual decisions, there are people who said, hey, I want to be about Jesus, I, I want to be baptized, I want to become a disciple. We're actually just children of members who are attending. Which made one of their leaders say, we haven't ever been very good at reaching people for Jesus, only reaching the children of people who already are. Later data that they released in the same study revealed that 80% of those children who make a profession of faith or are baptized or want to become disciples end up leaving the church in the faith when they turn 18. And I'm like, so that isn't working. Designing churches around huge, exciting, fun kids programs just isn't actually producing disciples. But this philosophy has remained in our North American churches. Build programming to attract casual Christian families, teach their kids moralistic lessons from the Bible, get the kids to make a profession of faith, count that as the church growing and reaching people for Jesus. When I started Horizon, uh, there was this uh, semi-famous guy who had started churches and written books, and um, he had built a church of several hundred people, and I had this opportunity to have a one-hour Zoom call with him. And I was all excited, and I had read his books, I had questions, and I was like, 
I'm going to ask him. I'm about to start the rise in church. I'm going to ask him my thoughts. And so we start talking, and he's like, let me just stop. The only thing you need to do is build an amazing kids program. As long as you build an amazing kids program, you'll get Christian families to come out, and your church will be set. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but how do I even get people who are asking questions about their faith? And how do I get people who are atheists, but they're like, I want to explore Christianity. He's like, those people aren't going to get money. He's like, why would you want that? He's like, build a good children's program. And he went on to say, you cannot succeed unless you reach, he didn't use the word casual Christian families, but Christian families by having a great kids program. This is the thinking on how to have a successful church, and it's so prevalent that churches push people to marry because a single person doesn't fit in their strategy for success. And I remember in the church in Tennessee over and over again, single people are like, I just feel like I don't belong because the church is designed for married people, not single people. And I thought no one in the first century said that about Christian church. <laughs> Oftentimes people feel like until marriage, single people are only good for using their time and resources to support the church programming for families and kids to drive up the size of the church. All this obsession with marriage still forgets one important thing. We believe that Jesus lived the greatest human life of anyone who ever lived. And he never married, and he never did. And churches all the time are like, get married, this is the greatest experience. Also, we believe Jesus lived the greatest human life of anyone who ever lived. Those two things contradict. Either Jesus lived the greatest human life, or marriage is the greatest human life. Your highest calling isn't marriage. It isn't even motherhood. Devotion to and discipleship to Jesus is the highest calling for any human person. In 1 Corinthians 7, verses 7 through 8, Paul says, I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One is this gift, another is that. But to the unmarried and the widows, I say this. It's good for you to stay unmarried as I am. That's just not what we say most of the time. We don't usually say, it's good for you to stay unmarried. We say the goal of life is to be married and to live like a Disney happily ever after. You know, like, right? Isn't that the story we hear constantly? Like, you just need to find your happily ever after. If that is the meaning of life, that the goal of life is to be married and to have a Disney happily ever after, there's no way that remaining single can ever be considered good. Paul says it's good for you to stay there. But if the goal of life is to become like Jesus, to become apprentices of how we live in love, then this verse could very much be true. Remaining unmarried could be good for your apprenticeship to Jesus. Now, there are a lot of single people who think, if only I was dating someone, I would be happy. There's a lot of dating people who think, if only I was married, I would be happy. There are a lot of married people who think, only if I was single again, would I be happy. There are a lot of married people who think, if only I could have a kid, I would be happy. To look to another human relationship to fulfill you is to place on them a God-sized burden that they will never be able to fulfill, and they will always feel the crushing weight to carry. We were destined for relationships. Humans were made for relationships. God says it's not good for humans not to have other human relationships. We long for them. But the only thing that can satisfy the deepest desire of our heart, the only thing that will make us into people of love, is being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, so that we can do what Jesus did. People of love aren't waiting until they are married or dating to love people, to serve people. They are finding people to love wherever they are, regardless of their stage of life right now. Now marriage can be hard, singleness can be hard, Singleness can be lonely, dating can be heartbreaking, but all of these can provide opportunities to take our apprenticeship to Jesus deeper, to find out that he truly satisfies us, to set aside our selfishness, and to love people like he did. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and being the ultimate example of love by laying down your life. You submitted to the will of the Father, and then you laid down your life. Thank you that we can become your students. We can learn from you how to live and love. And Lord, we truly believe that you lived the greatest human life. And you weren't married. And you didn't date. 
what our culture says and what even the church says sometimes is you have to have these things in order to have a full life. And I believe that you can have a full life with good, healthy human relationships, even if it means missing some of the human relationships you really wish you had. God, will you convince us that that is true? Will you make our lives whole as we seek you and we seek to serve the relationships that we're in? I pray this way in your name.
out however they need. So this Saturday, November 6th, we're going to meet at 9.45, and from 10 to noon, we will be the fans in the stands cheering on the players, and wherever they need us, we're just going to be there to serve and love them. So if you're interested, let us know, um, and we will let you know where we're going to meet and uh, show up there. And it's just always a fun time. We always have a great time just screaming at the top of our lungs, sideline cheerleaders. Uh, next week, and following the next two months, we will not meet in this room. We're going to be upstairs, uh, and we'll have some extra signs to make sure you get get there. There's going to be huge art show pieces hanging from the ceiling in here, so it's not going to be the best to have a church in this room. So we will be upstairs, I think in the green studio, but there's, I think it's a green door or something, I don't even know, but we're going to be upstairs, so we'll have extra signage for next week. Our core value for this week is people driven. We love to celebrate stories instead of numbers because we care about relationships and not religion. We share meals instead of starting small groups. We think people are more important than programs. May you find in Jesus the fulfillment of the deepest longings of your heart. And that is easier said than done. You are just this. Have a great week.